this week was um, this young lady, 36 years old, presents with a three-day history of fever, arthralgias, myalgias, and headache. And if we look at these relatively punctate pustule lesions, uh, this looks like bacteremia and sepsis. Uh, we learn that she hasn't traveled anywhere, uh, hasn't had any new sexual partners because this would fit with the gonorrheal sepsis also, but she does report that she has a pet rat. That's rather hokey. Uh, we're offered plague, rat bite fever, leptospirosis, tularemia, and hantavirus. Well, of the five possibilities, the best bet is rat bite fever, which is a spirillum minus mediated disease, which, spread by, which is spread by rat bites. And since she has a pet rat, this seems to be a relatively no brainer. But these other four choices are also involved with rodent transmitted diseases. Uh, for instance, plague, and had she had uh, black fingers or black extremities as shown here, uh, the black death would have been a pretty good choice, but these rather punctate pustular like lesions fit better with rat bite fever. And the poor rats don't get away for free either. Uh, they also suffer from plague, which is transmitted by their fleas, uh, which actually prefer rats, but only jump on humans if the rats are in trouble, uh, which they are during epidemics. Uh, this bacterium was identified by uh, Alexander Yersin, who was a Swiss French physician from 100 years ago, who was educated in uh, the Pasteur laboratory. And he actually isolated uh, the transmitters of plague in Vietnam, where he spent a good portion of his life. One reason that he was successful and other investigators were not is that because his incubator was so bad, he couldn't get it above 33 degrees centigrade. And other investigators looking for plague bacteria had better incubators that ran at 37 degrees centigrade. Turns out that these bacteria grow much better at 33 degrees centigrade than at 37 degrees centigrade. So much for the history lesson for today. A rat bite fever is caused by Spirilla minus, which is a spirochetal-like organism, and it's transmitted by rats, and the lesions that it cause, uh, causes look exactly like the image that we saw in the New England Journal uh, two slides ago. Uh, leptospirosis, also uh, transmitted from ro primarily through rodents through their urine, uh, also a spirillum-like organism, uh, but the problem here is primarily jaundice, liver failure, and renal failure, uh, so that the uh, sepsis-like lesions are not actually in the foreground as they were in this example. Tularemia, also common in Europe, primarily in Turkey and in Greece and uh, 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 countries where uh, goat herds and animal herds are commonly um, uh, cared for. This disease causes lymph node swelling. These are actually buboes, and if you told me that this patient, these patients had bubonic plague, I guess I would probably believe you. This condition was first identified in the United States in California in Tulare County, and that's why it's called tularemia. Next history lesson, hantavirus, also spread through mice and rats. Uh, first described on the River Hantan in South Korea. And during the Korean War, 3,000 American soldiers got hantavirus. And uh, they got a hemorrhagic fever and generally also got renal failure. And the hantavirus is ubiquitous, also present in Europe. And you have to think about it when patients get acute kidney injury of unknown etiology.
The first topic at the New England Journal concerns heart failure. And uh, we're not talking about reduced ejection fraction here. We're not talking about systolic heart failure. We're talking about diastolic heart failure. I think diastolic heart failure is a pretty good term, uh, but cardiologists being who they are, have decided to call this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And they call that HEF-PEF. Sounds rather corny, uh, as opposed to HEF-REF, which is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So much for the jargon. Now, heart failure implies that the heart has to operate at increased filling pressures in order, <coughs> excuse me, to meet the demands of the body. And half the patients that we see with heart failure actually have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. They have stiff ventricles, and the causes for that are hypertensive remodeling, sedentary lifespan uh, style, uh, obesity, and metabolic stress. In other words, these are the usual subjects and uh, uh, are ubiquitous. Now, we know that we can treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction by addressing the renin-angiotensin system, and we've had evidence recently that by also inhibiting neutral endopeptidases, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction uh, can be improved. Now, neutral endopeptidases are ubiquitous and uh, do a variety of different things in the body. And the enzyme that we're talking about is called neprolysin, which is a matrix metalloproteinase that's present on endothelial cells and elsewhere. Now, neprolysin can convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 1 through 7, which is supposed to be helpful. Uh, but in terms of the paper for today, uh, neprolysin also degrades natriuretic peptides that address various receptors. And we believe that by inhibiting neprolysin, the function of natriuretic peptides is improved, which could help patients with heart failure. Now, we know that this scenario works for patients that have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In this study, um, the drug that uh, is a combination uh, Sacubitril plus Valsartan uh, was tested against Valsartan alone in patients that have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So all these patients had an ejection fraction of at least greater than 45%, which is actually reduced, but not very much, normal being about 65% ejection fraction. Now, the control group got Valsartan at 160 milligrams twice a day, which is a pretty stiff dose. Might be okay for men, but we've had some evidence that perhaps this dose might be a little hefty for women. And in this study, half the patients were female because diastolic heart failure is particularly common in women. So the primary outcome here was um, <coughs> Uh, cardiovascular outcome and hospitalizations and also secondary outcomes were worsening renal function and variables of that sort. And if we look at the patients, half the patients are women. Uh, these are older patients. They're um, 72 years old in both groups. Lots of patients, uh, 2,407 in this group and 2,389 in that group. And the randomization worked pretty well. Uh, the, almost all of these patients have hypertension. Half of them have diabetes. Atrial fibrillation, of course, is common. Some of them have already had a stroke, and they've had problems with heart failure in the past. And the patients are all getting, essentially all getting, diuretic therapy of some sort. Uh, at screening, they get inhibitors of the renin angiotensin system. Um, a, quarter of them get spironolactone, and a high proportion of them get beta blockers, although all of these drugs really aren't very efficacious in patients that have diastolic heart failure. And what we see here is the primary outcome shows no significant effect. So it doesn't look like this strategy of simultaneously inhibiting 
Neprolysin is better than valsartan alone. And the evidence that valsartan alone helps patients with diastolic heart failure is also not so great. Although in some ARB studies, such as the CHARM study, in a subgroup, it looked like patients with diastolic heart failure might have been helped by candesartan. But at any rate, if we look at the total hospitalizations for heart failure and death from cardiovascular disease, the difference here is about 1%. And um, so th that's not much. Death from cardiovascular disease, the difference here is uh, 0%. And if we look at various subgroups, it looks like patients that are less than 75 years old did a little bit better than older patients. And it looks like patients that are female did a little better than the patients that were male where there was no effect whatsoever. And if we look at these various subgroups, the authors imply that maybe uh, this combination was indeed a little bit better than Valsartan, uh, but uh, alone, but the statisticians thought otherwise. Now, recall that the dose of Valsartan here in the control group was greater than the dose of Valsartan in the uh, uh, combined therapy group. So indeed, uh, the development of decreased renal function, getting a creatinine greater than two, uh, was significantly greater in the Valsartan alone group. Uh, but episodes of hypotension were a little more common in the combined group. So you pays your money and takes your choice. So basically this study was negative, uh, although the authors imply that there might be some subgroups or particularly in women uh, that might benefit from the combined therapy. <clears throat> the next topic again is P2 Y12 receptors, which exist on platelets that we've, had, that we've discussed before. And this is the receptor for ADP. And this is a G protein coupled receptor, results in change in platelet shape and platelet aggregation. And we, want to inhibit this receptor in patients that un undergo percutaneous cardiovascular interventions. And the drugs that we've used for this, we've discussed here at this exercise in great detail, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and cangrelor, uh, and ticagrelor are the drugs that are currently most popular for inhibiting P2Y12 uh, receptors. Now, clopidogrel is the cheapest drug. And there's no evidence it's any worse than the other drugs in patients in whom it works. But clopidogrel is a prodrug, and it has to be converted to an active agent uh, by certain enzymes in order to, for it to be effective. So uh, if we look at the enzymes that, that are enzyme that's responsible for this, we find it's a P450 microoxidase, abbreviated CYP. 2C19. Now there's CYP2C19 alleles which cause the enzyme to be relatively or even completely inactive so that clopidogrel isn't converted to the active form and then is not in a position to inhibit the P2Y12 receptor. I hope you're following me uh, because what this study is about is going to the trouble of genotyping patients that need P2Y12 inhibition to see if they would be susceptible for treatment with clopidogrel or not. An alternative would be just to treat them with one of these other drugs, uh, but some of them are still under patent, and so they cost a lot more than clopidogrel. Then this raises the question, is, is uh, genotyping, is gene testing more or less expensive than just giving them the more expensive drug? So what was done in this study is that patients that needed uh, P2Y12 inhibition uh, were randomized to either genetic testing to see if they would be susceptible to clopidogrel, and if they were uh, susceptible to, to clopidogrel, they then got that drug, and if they weren't susceptible to, to clopidogrel, they either got prasugrel or ticagrelor, and the other group just got uh, that didn't get any genetic, genetic testing, all of them got prasugrel or ticagrelor, which is what the European 
Society of Cardiology currently recommends. The Society, European Society of Cardiology does not recommend genetic testing. But that's what was done in this study. So in half the subjects, uh, 1,200 patients, they got genotype guided therapy. And in the other half, they just got the two drugs that don't require conversion to inhibit the P2Y12 receptor. So as you can imagine, in the genotype guided group, 60% um, getting clopid got clopidogrel, and then in the other group, only 7%, probably because the investigators didn't do what they were told to do to give the patients prazogrel or ticagrelor. But at any rate, in both of these groups, the 95% of the patients got a P2Y12 inhibitor of one sort or another, and they all got aspirin, and some of them got some other oral anticoagulants for various reasons also. And if we look here, here's the primary combined outcome. Here's the real world, and here is uh, where this uh, scale is changed, and what we see here is a 1% difference. That's not statistically significant. That implies that the genotype guided group was no worse than the standard group. I guess that's nice. For reasons that aren't clear to me, uh, the genotype guided group, most 60% uh, of them got clopidogrel, had a little bit less bleeding than the standard treatment group. Here's the real world. This difference is 2%, so it was statistically significant. But the bleeding episodes, as we'll see in a minute, were minor. And if we look at the supplement, secondary thrombotic outcomes, no statistically significant difference. Here, he's the, here's the real world. And minor bleeding was a little bit more common in the prazogrel to cagrelor group compared to the genotype-guided clopidogrel group. I'm not quite sure that why this outcome was of that nature, because I'm not aware that clopidogrel, if it's effective, is less effective than, than these other two drugs. But the bleeding uh, episodes were minor in any event. So the non-inferiority uh, analysis indicates that gene testing is no worse than uh, using the other two drugs. I guess that's nice. And the primary bleeding outcome, uh, minor bleeding, was a little more common in the standard group compared to the genotype guided group. Now, I personally think that this difference is fairly trivial and fairly modest. But my friend Dan Roden, who wrote an editorial on this topic, indicates that this study gives strong support for genotype guided approach to uh, but I guess only if you insist on wanting to use clopidogrel, because for the other two drugs, genotype-guided approach would be irrelevant. The next topic in the Lancet is colon cancer. And, uh, in the Lancet, in the New England Journal is colon cancer. And we learned in the Lancet last week that there are a number of mutations that are associated with colon cancer that lead to worse outcomes, and one of them is BRAF mutations. And the important BRAF mutation is a V600E mutation, which is fairly common in colon cancer, and this mutation results in a worse prognosis. Now, we can deal with this activated BRAF uh, by using encorafenib or venomatinib, and we can also treat colon cancer by inhibiting VEGF receptors, which may play some role in metastases, with cetuximab, or we can just give the patients um, fol uh, folinic acid, fluorouracil, and irinonin tectan, which is the current approved chemotherapy for colon cancer. So these poor patients uh, received either one of these three regimens, and what we can see is whether or not the triple therapy or the double therapy was better than standard chemotherapy. And what we see here is that the triple therapy, getting the two drugs that inhibit the B activating BRAF mutation plus the VEGF and receptor antibody, did a bit better. Uh, they lived nine months instead of five months. That's a four-month survival difference. 
okay, and the various subgroups also showed a benefit of this treatment. So this is not a cure for colon cancer, but it does give the patients a little better options than the control group. And if we look at these waterfall diagrams, the tri triple therapy looks a little bit better than double therapy alone, which looks better uh, than the standard chemotherapy. But the difference amounts to four months in survival. Now, there are prices to be paid for this triple therapy, and they include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and uh, skin lesions. But if you ask the patients, they'd probably rather live nine months than five months. So this triple regimen is probably indicated for people that have colon cancer that also exhibit this BRAF V600E mutation, which is fairly common in colon cancer. The next topic is pretty complicated and involves Batten's disease. And if you aren't familiar with Batten's disease, I won't hold it against you because it's basically an autosomal recessive disease that results in lipofuxin storage within lysosomes. And uh, these are present throughout the entire body, but the organ that's mostly involved here is the central nervous system. So these poor children that are homozygous for these mutations uh, develop seizure disorders, uh, mental retardation, uh, eye movement disturbances, as you can see in this youngster, and they usually die before age 20, and there is no treatment. Fortunately, this Batten's disease, which in German is generally called Spielmeier Vogt disease. And Oscar Vogt used to work at this institution where I currently reside. Um, ha this has a bad prognosis. And the treatment here we're going to show you in a minute involves splicing. Now, splicing is a term that actually comes from uh, um, electronic technical industry, where if you put cables back together that have been severed, the term for this is called a splice. And in molecular genetics, we refer to splicing as the mechanism that's used to cut introns out of mRNA to make an mRNA that's intron free. But we've learned that there are modifications, splice modifications, so that modified proteins can be produced from the same gene. And we've learned that uh, post-transcription processing of RNA, including splicing, capping, tailing, and other changes have a major influence on how these messenger RNAs actually work. So that's where this term comes from. So here we see our patient, and this is a patient is a six-year-old girl that presents with blindness, ataxia, seizures, and developmental regression. And in the differential diagnosis is Batten's disease. So the various genes that are involved in Batten's disease were sequenced in this patient, and she has a typical mutation in one of her alleles uh, that involve uh, an enzyme that's involved in Batten's disease. Now, this uh, patient was heterozygous for a known mutation in um, the gene that's responsible for here, uh, for this the patient's problem here, and the gene is MFSD8. And uh, she has this known, she's heterozygous for this known mutation in MFSD8. And so the investigators were wondered what's going on with the other allele, which didn't have this mutation. So the patient was subjected to massive sequencing. And what was found is that in her DNA from the other allele, she has an insertion of an SVA. This is a VNTR, variable number of tandem repeats. This is basically an allo repeat. These are relatively common, but this one is mediated by a retrotransposon. 
So she has this retro transposon that's located in an intron, and superficially we would think it would have no effect on the mRNA that's produced, but that's not the case here, because this retro transposon, which is a two kilobase insertion, uh, results in a faulty splicing, so that she produces a cryptic splice acceptor site, which means that she makes a mess, uh, an mRNA uh, which doesn't make the protein that should be encoded by MFSD8 so that her lysosomes don't work properly and she gets this lysosomal storage disease. So the idea here is how can we get around this faulty uh, trans this transposon that's causing this cryptic slice splice acceptor site. And for that purpose, the investigators and the company that's responsible for this report recalled that in spinomuscular atrophy, uh, there's also a splice pattern problem here. And there's a dr drug that was developed for that, which is also an antisense oligonucleotide to circumvent this splice abnormality. And that drug is called neurocinericin. But that drug couldn't possibly work in this patient because every one of these splice site mutations is only uh, relevant for a given individual. So what the investigators did is they developed a new antisense oligo to deal with this particular cryptic splice site, and that's shown here. Uh, here's a, what would normally happen here. We would just excise this entire intron and the mRNA would make a normal protein. But this patient has this uh, transposon here, labeled SVA. This is this CNA VNTR allo repeat. And in order to, and this transposon that's present in this intron uh, causes this abnormal splice site. So in order to circumvent this problem, uh, the patient, uh, the physicians developed a new drug to, uh, so that uh, this faulty splice site is no longer produced. That turns this patient into a heterozygote, not a normal human being, but a heterozygote, and heterozygosity should be enough to circumvent this problem. And if we look at this drug that they made, uh, we can see that this drug fixes her fibroblasts, which are grown in cultures. So here's what her fibroblast lysosomes are gathering up all this lipofuxin positive material. But when they're treated with this drug that circumvents this abnormal splice site, the fibroblasts look normal. Then how do you give this drug to the patient? So the patient receives this drug uh, intrathecally. That means she has to have a lumbar puncture every 14 days to administer this drug. And we can see the concentration of this. This is also the case in patients that have spinal muscular atrophy. We've discussed that at this uh, exercise earlier. We can see that the uh, antisense oligonucleotide uh, reaches relatively high levels. And is the patient helped by this? Well, the seizure trends seem to be going down, although the patient still has a lot of seizures. Uh, but uh, electroencephalographically and by increasing the dose, it looks like the patient's seizures have gotten better. And this is the argument that the authors use here in terms of producing a customized oligonucleotide to circumvent this abnormal splice site that's causing Batten's disease, but only in this particular patient. So this is a courageous experiment where n equals one, I apologize for the misspelling here, uh, and it's a demonstration project, if you will. Now here's the patient from last week that had these peculiar calcifications of the fingertips, and the fingertips, this really doesn't look like the sclerodactyly that we generally see in scleroderma, but that's what this patient is supposed to have had. Here's another patient, 60-year-old woman, still smoking, comes in with acute chest pain, has an elevated troponin level indicating acute coronary syndrome, has this electrocardiogram here, 
We would expect this to be an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, but she doesn't have ST segment elevations, at least not in the 12 standard leads. She has marked ST segment depression uh, in <clears throat> these anterior leads, V1 through V6, shown here. So what's going on here? Coronary angiogram is done and she has a closure of her left anterior circumflex coronary artery, which can also provide blood supply for the posterior aspect of the heart. So if we do additional leads, V7, V8, V9, we then see ST segment elevation indicating the acute myocardial infarction. And that's the idea in this report. Next topic, concerns the review in the New England Journal, pretty complicated because it involves von Willebrand's factor. You'll recall that von Willebrand's factor is made by endothelial cells in all blood vessels. And then von Willebrand's factor serves as the anchoring mechanism for platelets. So if we damage our vascular wall, uh, von Willebrand's factor aggregates the platelets, uh, which uh, then, uh, results in aggregation of additional platelets to plug this hole in this vessel. And there's also circulating von Willebrand's factor. Uh, deficiencies in von Willebrand's factor are the most common cause of uh, hereditary bleeding, not hemophilia, it's von Willebrand's factor. But if von Willebrand's factor is hyperactive because of endothelial injury or some other reason, people can get thrombotic microangiopathy and that can take place in the kidney, or it can take place in the central nervous system. If it primarily involves the kidney, we call this hemolytic uremic syndrome. And this generally is caused by endothelial injury due to shigatoxin or shigatoxin-like mechanisms, or can also be caused by complement problems, as shown here. This results in thrombotic microangiopathy but von Willebrand's factor is pivotal for the development of this thrombotic microangiopathy. Now we've discussed <coughs> thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which is a thrombotic microangiopathy that, that primarily involves the central nervous system. And we've discussed a paper that was present, uh, presented in the New England Journal in January of this year, where people with TTP, were treated with an antibody against von Willebrand's factor to inhibit the development of von Willebrand factors multimeres that result in TTPs, but multimeres are also involved in the generation of HUS as we discussed earlier. That's not the topic for the moment. The re review in the New England Journal concerns hereditary thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. I would think that this a hereditary problem could also cause HUS, but it primarily seems to cause TTP. And uh, this hereditary form of TTP involves mutations in ADAMTS13, which also plays a role in HUS. ADAMTS13 is required for, the, for controlling von Willebrand's factors so that it doesn't get out of hand. It cleaves von Willebrand's factor multimeres. And the only substrate for this, it's also a matrix metalloproteinase, the only substrate is von Willebrand's factor. So thank goodness mutations in ADAMTS13 are not common, uh, but they can occur. And that's indicated in this table. And how this works is uh, um, ADAMTS13 is supposed to clean these things out. And if ADAMTS13 doesn't work properly, then these von Willebrand's multimeres make these thrombi that results in the disease. And uh, these people that have mutations, and there have been 200 mutations described in ADAMTS13, 200 separate mutations. So you have to sequence the whole thing in order to find the patients that have this problem. And uh, these patients may go for years without having any problem. And then all of a sudden, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, uh, these mutations become relevant so that multimeres aren't cleared and the patients get TTPs.
can also result in neonatal jaundice at birth or purpura at some later date from because the platelets are used up or problems in pregnancy with spontaneous abortions and problems of this nature. So how do we separate acquired TTP from hereditary TTP? Well, acquired TTP is generally caused by antibody inhibitors of ADAMS-13. Being able to assay ADAMS-13 is pivotal, pivotal to make these diagnoses. And if there are mutations present, then ADAMS-13 levels are low without an inhibitor being present. How are these patients treated? They also respond to platelet, trans, uh, platelet infusions, or they may uh, require prophylactic uh, plasma infusions at periodic intervals. And um, you might think that this therapy would result in antibody, alloantibodies against ADAMS-13, and that's also been described, although thank goodness it's not common. Now, the patient in the New England Journal was a 35-year-old pregnant woman who was subjected to a cesarean section, which was indicated because of placenta previa, and uh, uh, the baby is delivered without incidence, but during uh, the uh, then basically removal of the placenta and closure, this patient suddenly suffers a cardiac arrest. And that's the clinical problem. So 19 days before admission, the blood work in this patient was pretty much okay. Then 45 minutes after the delivery of the infant, as this laboratory evaluation is done, she's only got 64,000 platelets. She has a prothrombin time that's slightly prolonged but her partial thromboplastin time, which checks the intrinsic clotting system, is 150 seconds, and it ought to be less than 28. So it looks like her fibrinogen level is also disappearing. So it looks like this patient has disseminated intravascular coagulation or consumptive coagulopathy that's suddenly taken place all of a sudden. So if we look at these things, we can look at what's the differential diagnosis of women that have cardiac arrest during delivery. Pulmonary embolism, massive hemorrhage, venous air embolism, anaphylactic reactions to some sort of drugs that the patient's got, um, and even preeclampsia, eclampsia, although we ought to be able to diagnose that by looking for proteinuria and measuring blood pressure. In the foreground here is amniotic fluid embolism, which thank goodness is not common, but which results in consumptive coagulopathy. This is like infusing the patients with tissue factor. And that's what happens. So the discussant discusses the differential diagnosis and it's pretty obvious this has to be amniotic fluid embolism, a very much feared complication in obstetrics, but well known. What can you do here? Resuscitate the patients. But basically, we have to rely on God to make this go away. So how can we support the patients in the meantime? Echocardiography was done here. Shows uh, markedly in uh, overload of the right ventricular system. That could also be seen in massive pulmonary embolism and other conditions, but amniotic fluid embolism would also show this picture. So this patient was treated with a heart-lung machine, a modern heart-lung machine, which is about the size of a briefcase, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And uh, this machine was a, a large four French catheters were placed in femoral vessel, vessels. She was put on ECMO. And within 48 hours, all of this business was better, and she went home on post-operative day five. Here's another report in the New England Journal. This one, this one sort of, I, this one really fascinated me. Can we identify people's faces on the basis of their MRI scans of their brains? And if we have the right software, we probably can. This is relevant because MRI scans are shared between institutions and 
uh, uh, to protect the patient's privacy, their identification, their names and date of birth and all of this stuff is removed from the scans. But what we can see here in this little report, these are five volunteers from the Mayo Clinic. They were all subjected to these scans. And if we look at these, this, uh, you can see an outline. This is a lateral of the face. Can we reconstruct the face from these pictures? And the answer is, yes, we can. And some patients might not like this. These are the pictures of the people with their eyes open. Here they are with their eyes shut. And in these scanners, you usually have your eyes shut. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what the software created. And you can match these up to the faces. Now, since the people, everybody, even I am in the internet, my face is in the internet. So if somebody has an MRI scan from me, they can probably find me and find out to whom that MRI scan belongs. Now, I personally don't care, but some people might. And so this is an example of recognition software. And we've discussed this paper that relies on DNA sequencing to determine what people look like. And here, here's just some examples. Here are the patients. And I like uh, uh, half of these images are here are photos done from cell phones, and the other half is the reconstruction done on the basis of their genomic DNA. I think this puts the business about data protection in an entirely different perspective. Have fun with that. So we move to the Lancet, and the first topic of the Lancet involves dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibition. And you'll recall that incretins are inactivated by DPP4, but we can block this inactivation with the DPP4 inhibitor. And DPP4 inhibitors have been developed to treat type 2 diabetes. I don't think they're so great, but the manufacturers think otherwise. So the question in this first paper is, is the introduction of a DPP4 inhibitor early in the game for type 2 diabetes of some example, is that of some benefit? And the endpoint in the study that I'm going to show you is a hemoglobin A1C of greater than 7% or greater than 53 millimoles per mole of hemoglobin. So here's the study. Uh, all these patients with type 2 diabetes were randomized to either metformin metformin in a staged increase in dose, or metformin combined with vildagliptin. And the hypothesis here is we can maintain the hemoglobin A1C of less than 7% for a longer period of time. So here are the patients, and this is how this was done. The control group got metformin at a high dose, and if they, if this did, if they failed that, they then got vildagliptin added to their metformin, and if they failed that, they got insulin. The Verum group got vildagliptin up front with their metformin, and then uh, period two, if, the, if they failed that, they got more metformin and vildagliptin, and if they failed that, they also got insulin. This study is perhaps not so thrilling but uh, the manufacturers, manufacturers of Vildagliptin probably had to do it to satisfy the FDA. 1,000 patients in both groups, type 2 diabetics, body mass index greater than 30, um, GFR is still okay, um, median weight 85 kilograms for these patients. They look like they're type 2 diabetics. And indeed, it looks like giving vildagliptin up front with metformin keeps the patients in better hypoglycemic in glycemic control than adding vildagliptin at some later date. And this result is statistically significant, which makes the manufacturer very happy. And this seemed to be, uh, in a variety of subgroups, seemed to be the case. One exception was Australia. I have no idea why. Uh, but uh, statistically, this is irrelevant. Now, one of the problems with inhibiting DPP-4 and also giving in cretins for type 2 diabetes is concern about pancreatitis or the development of pancreatic carcinoma. That was not the case here. 
So it looks like if you give viloglyptin up front, that seems to be a good idea. Now, the second paper in The Lancet involves ventricular shunting, which is done in children with hydrocephalus and also people that have acquired hydrocephalus from intracerebral hemorrhage, for instance. And these shunts are either standard shunts or they're impregnated with something to avoid infection. And the common impregnating agent that's used is silver, probably a silver nitrate. I couldn't find out for certain. And the hypothesis here that was tested is impregnating these shunts with clindamycin and rifampin, is that better than silver shunts or just standard shunts? So 3,000 people were randomized here. And then to determine shunt infection is also not trivial. If you have a positive culture, that's great, but sometimes the cultures are uncertain and you have to rely on other clinical signs of infection, pleocytosis in the cerebrospinal fluid, et cetera. And uh, so these endpoints were outlined in this table. So here are the patients. Age at randomization, most of these patients were adults, although a third were pediatric patients. Some of them were older patients, men and women are represented. And if we look at the culture results, and if we look at this, it looks like the antibiotic shunt does a little better than the silver shunt or the standard care shunt. And that indeed ended up being the case. So here's the antibiotic shunt, it's down here, and the silver shunt and the standard shunt are significantly worse, although all the shunts do pretty well. Infection, which is a very feared complication, wasn't that common, but it's significantly less in the rifampin-coated uh, uh, shunts um, compared to the silver shunts. Not a dramatic difference, but it was statistically significant, so probably we ought to be giving the patients with these antibiotic impregnated shunts rather than the silver impregnated shunts or the standard shunts. The next topic concerns hyperkalemia, which is a very feared complication, albeit not that, in my view, not that common, but physicians are terribly afraid of hyperkalemia, although I think hypokalemia kills more people than hyperkalemia. One way to avoid hyperkalemia is to, instead of putting the people on a banana-free diet, is to give them a potassium binder that binds potassium in the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, what's been get used for this purpose for 50 years is a polystyrene exchange resin, which is called Kxlate in the United States, or Azonium in Europe. Uh, but that drug isn't very good and it has complications. So a new material has been developed called pteromer, which is a potassium binder and the complicated structure I've shown here. And in this particular study, patients that had decreased renal function that would be candidates to receive spironolactone, they're most of them getting ACE inhibitors anyway, uh, were uh, randomly assigned to spironolactone, and then those patients were randomly assigned to treatment with pteromer or placebo to see if pteromer would decrease episodes of hyperkalemia. Now, nobody died in this study, so we're not talking about severe hyperkalemia. But when we look at the patients that were on spironolactone, we see that the patients that were on spironolactone and pteromer were able to continue their spironolactone to a greater degree than the patients that were, uh, were not given pteromer that received some placebo treatment. This result would imply that pteromer allows more patients to be treated with spironolactone, which is rumored to be particularly good for you if you need to inhibit the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system in patients that have diminished renal function. And we can look at the proportion uh, with an event, in this case, potassium levels that are above a certain threshold that was given in the paper, occurred less commonly in the people that got pteromer. Now, you'll, the surprising, it's not surprising, but pteromer, which is new, is far more expensive than spironolactone, which has been around for 60 years, which means that the drug to in, in suppress the complication is far more expensive 
than the drug that's supposed to increase survival, which I think is somewhat paradoxical, but nobody seems to care. So if we look at this, pteromere indeed suppresses the development of hyperkalemia in patients that are simultaneously treated with spironolactone. The manufacturer, I'm sure, had to do this to achieve FDA approval. Advertisement for pteromere is formidable. So you'll probably be confronted with that. Then the next topic in the Lancet concerns ophthalmopathy of prematurity. Uh, premature infants, particularly if they receive large amounts of oxygen, uh, develop um, a proliferative retinopathy. Uh, and the, I, that is treated by laser. And it might be that treating these, injecting a VEGF inhibitor into the eyes of these infants might spare them the laser treatment. And that's what was tested here. So these poor infants that have a birth weight of less than 800 grams, which when I was a junior physician, this was sort of the survival level. We do a little better in treatment of these premature infants now. But these infants are at a high risk for developing ophthalmopathy. So two-thirds of them received the antibody against VEGF at two different doses, and one-third received laser treatment and complicated randomization and switching from one group to another. But what we see here is the kitties that got the high dose of ranibizumab had lower VEGF levels uh, in their eyes than the patients that got the lower dose of ranibizumab. And of course, laser therapy has no influence on VEGF levels. So actually the patients that got the higher dose of VEGF did better than the infants with laser treatment, so some of these infants might be spared the laser treatment. Now the review in The Lancet concerns opioid dependence. This is a worldwide problem, uh, not addressed in this review, but I think that this problem is generally caused by physicians that give opioids for pain without a necessary substrate for pain. So there are 40 million people that are dependent, they're addicted to opioids worldwide. And what do we do about this? And uh, there's some comparisons made about deaths of opioid abuse in Kentucky or in Kiev or in Tehran. I didn't realize, I thought in Tehran, opioid addicts would probably be stoned or executed, but apparently that's not the case. So these patients probably ought to be given or offered opioid agonist therapy, which is basically methadone or buprenorphine. And uh, all this is discussed in this review. And uh, they even solicited some comments on opioid abusers and what they think about this. And you can spread all over the world, even in Nepal or in Australia, and you can look at this. I was somewhat shocked by this graphic here, indicating that the doses per million people per day of opioids, this is not unknown in Germany. U.S. is worse, but Germany is up there. And if we look at the red line here, uh, the prescriptions, the amount of drugs that are uh, uh, consumed is substantial in Europe and Germany is at the top of the list. So we may have a problem here. And if we look at this worldwide, uh, here's Iran and uh, they're onto this too. Uh, in this particular graphic, Germany doesn't look quite so bad. This is Germany, Poland, Sweden, uh, Spain, compared to the United States and other areas of the world. So this is a problem and to, uh, criminal justice system, sure, and uh, problems with HIV and hepatitis C virus and all of this. And so some comparisons are made between Kentucky, Kiev, and Tehran. So you can read about that here. The second review in the Lancet concerns marijuana. Now, I personally don't see any benefit of marijuana. 
Uh, and we had a review in the New England Journal indicating that marijuana may play some role in a very obscure seizure disorder, but otherwise there's no evidence that marijuana has any medicinal benefit. Don't tell the world I said that because in the internet, the opinion is against me. So here's marijuana use. Uh, and um, South America, is, uh, even some of these Arab countries, uh, Mohammed had nothing against marijuana, apparently. And that's all reviewed here. Is marijuana good for depression? Is it good for psychosis? Is it good for dependency uh, of other drugs? Is it good for low birth weight? I don't know. But if you want to find out, read this review. And uh, does it reduce pain? I wouldn't think so. At least in the New England Journal, all the pain studies were negative. But people are convinced that this is the running stuff to treat pain. So cannabis is the most widely used illicit drug globally. And the states, Canada and 10 states in the United States are, have legalized marijuana. Is that a good idea? I don't really know. Um, I mean, even Bill Clinton smoked with marijuana, but he swears that he didn't inhale. Now, this, the case in The Lancet is this 37-year-old woman that shows up with um, uh, Phlegmasia cerulea dolens. And she actually has it. Here it is, Phlegmasia cerulea dolens. This is massive thrombophlebitis, and she only has it in her left leg and her D-dimer concentrations are off the map. Now, why would a 37-year-old woman get Phlegmasia cerulea dolens? And in the differential diagnosis is the May-Turner syndrome. And that involves suppression of the left iliac vein by the right iliac artery. And here's the anatomy shown here. And here's a cross section, here's a vertebral body. And here's the right common iliac artery squishing this poor left iliac vein. And that's also the whole poor, the whole thing is thrombosed here. And uh, these collaterals have developed. And when the physicians recognized that this woman has the May Turner syndrome, they were able to treat her accordingly. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to hear this same business in German, we start in three minutes. Nicht zu verwechseln mit diesem Turner-Syndrom, was... Nö, das, das wird auch nie mit TH geschrieben. Ja, 